to Inference, an AI business podcast by Silo AI. I'm Ville Hulko, co-founder of Silo, the largest private AI app in the Nordics that focuses on building human-centric AI for businesses. With me today is Professor Steven Olstrup. Steven is one of the most heavy-hitting experts of Denmark's digital affairs. A professor of algorithms at University of Copenhagen, the chair of the National Digital Advisory, as well as the co-founder and CEO of Subwiz, a company that enhances service and support through omnichannel and customized AI solutions. Steven, it's good to have you with us. Welcome. Thanks a lot. So I gave a bit of a brief intro into your background, but it would also be great if you could kind of introduce yourself. So who are you, Stephen? Wow, I think you covered it pretty good here. <laughs> but to, to, to sum up, uh, I've been a professor in algorithms and AI for a long time. We're actually doing it uh, really good. The research institute I have is uh, the university is uh, number one in, uh, in algorithms in Europe and number four in the world. Uh, and then I've been um, a political advisor for a long time, including the new Danish digital strategy I've been uh, working on. But currently here, I'm mostly uh, the CEO in my recent startup uh, called Subquiz, which is for AI for customer service support. I've made a startup before, very successful, got acquired by an American companies for some years ago. And that was also where we were using uh, heavily on algorithms. So about a month ago, Denmark released her new national digital strategy. Could you give us a glimpse to what some of the core elements within it work? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at it from a Danish perspective here, I mean, maybe generally in the Nordic here, we were really fast to get the broadband out to everyone. That means that we got a lot of consumers. We In Denmark, we also had uh, were really fast in uh, getting... Uh, and IT education at the university on a very high level. So we got really good creators, few, but good creators. And then we are in Denmark number one, according to EU, FN and OECD and so on, in uh, public digitalization. That means how you're interacting with the public uh, sector. And and this, this means that we, with the internet and the public strategy in digitalizations, we have a lot of consumers in Denmark and a few creators. That's actually really, really good. I've been creating a, a lot of uh, good things in Denmark. Recently, we are talking a lot about that our efficiency in uh, in the corona vaccines, getting that out, uh, that, that we were capable of doing that. But also, if you look in, uh, in from, we're really good in uh, creating new unicorns. The, on the bad side, yeah, is that we're seeing that other countries are doing much more in education and in IT than we are doing in Denmark. In Denmark, it's mostly just at the university level, whereas other countries have been starting doing, you know, IT and computer science already in uh, primary school and high schools and so on. So that that's a big thing. And another big thing in Denmark is that we're really good in creating unicorns, but we're not good at keeping them in, in Denmark. So what you what you are seeing right now is that we have this uh, big digitalization process uh, all over the world here, and that is actually requiring that we get a lot of creators here. And and every time you're digitalizing something, then you there's some jobs disappearing and some digital jobs are appearing here. But the digital jobs appearing is we, we need to move them to the outside Denmark because we don't have the workforce in Denmark, and so we are in a situation where we are seeing that that all the new money, meaning both the companies and the work, are moved outside Denmark. Right now, because we are running on a success for many years, uh, for 10 and 20 years back, what we did, we, we're not harmed by it, but we can see that we will very soon be harmed by it. So today we'll be reviewing the state of AI in Denmark from basically three points of views, the private sector, the academia, and the public sector. And if we start off with the private sector, um, when we talk about large-scale organizations in Denmark, um, how, in your perspective, has AI adoption been progressing? 
have some of the largest organizations been successful in establishing their own operations or how would you describe past few years in Denmark? So so there's a lot of uh, reports and analyzing going on and, and what we're seeing is that if, if we look into large corporations then actually we have been pretty successful in adopting and using uh, AI technologies uh, in large corporations but here we're talking about very large corporations I mean like the 20 largest companies in Denmark here. It's, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have been inventing uh, their own AI, but maybe they have just been adapting some technologies and put them into production. Yeah? But if we, if we go to the smaller companies, and when I say smaller companies, I mean companies with uh, below 250 uh, employees, then then we have a very low, slow, uh, there's, there's not a lot of things happening in Denmark. There's a lot of like, you know, uh, PUCs going on, like proof of concept, but going from proof of concept to put things in production, that's a huge step. And I suppose that was a lot, there's a lot of similarity how things were happening in Finland a few years back, because if we look at the, some of the reports um, released by the Finnish AI accelerator, FIA, um, the jump from 2017 to 2018 in terms of AI adoption was around 2%, as I recall. And one of the biggest reasons for that, I suppose, was the transfer from POCs into the actual implementation stages. But especially for smaller scale organizations, you really can't make that jump without learning the ropes. You know, with a POC-driven approach, which ironically enough, isn't usually very much visible in the bottom line. Absolutely, yeah. So we totally agree, and the same picture we are seeing in Denmark here is we have a very hard for small companies going from PUCs to production. But then again, what do you mean by AI? I had had a really good story the other day here with kindergarten teacher, where you know there was some um, people not talking Danish, only I don't know Turkish maybe, and then she was using Google Translate to communicate with them. And this, I mean, Google Translate is based on AI. So, so this kindergarten teacher is actually putting AI production in the kindergarten, right? I mean, so how do you define AI and put it, what do you mean by putting in the production and so on here? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very fair point. And I suppose in a lot of the reports, at least, the line drawn in sand is measured with the internal development. So are there people or engineers or modeling experts working within organizations in implementing these? But yeah, it's it's absolutely true that when you start to kind of expand on that point of view, like just using a basic set of tools, like using a CRM tool, for example, there's a high likelihood that you're already using machine learning. So it's a bit of a skewed curve, if you will. Exactly, exactly. And somehow, you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of natural for uh, technology starting being something which should be handheld to something which, which is just without thinking about it. And if you look into, you know, 20 years ago, everywhere, or 30 years ago, I don't know, and you were playing chess, everybody was talking about, oh, I'm using AI and I'm playing against the machine. And, and I mean, this you could play games against the machine and this artificial intelligence. Today, we just do it. And no one is kind of thinking about this is AI, right? So, but it is, there's a lot of AI in, into the, all the games here. And, and it's kind of a natural step that we have PUC, then we have production, it's handheld, and then we're moving on to uh, like, uh, we're just doing it without thinking about it. And I suppose it's it's kind of similar, like with the era of cloud, like you go back five years, everyone was discussing about whether or not an organization is using cloud in their operations. Today, it's, it's, it's a non-thing, right? So, you know, cloud is a part of the toolkit, but it's no longer actively being discussed in everyday narrative. So I suppose we're kind of seeing a similar transfer with machine learning too. And asking about the supply side of AI. So in Denmark, how have startups and consultancies and similar suppliers of machine le- learning capabilities emerged? Um, is there now an emerging scene of AI startups or AI consultancies in Denmark? Or how would you describe kind of the supply side of machine learning? So we, we have, uh, I think we have tons of startups uh, saying that we're doing AI. And you, you know, the valuation of startups saying they're doing AI are, are higher than startups saying they're not doing AI. So to a credit extent, there's maybe many of these uh, companies which are they doing AI or not? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I was for one and a half year, two years ago, I was trying to make a conference in Denmark for Danish AI put into production. Yeah. 
And I actually had a problem just coming up with five good examples. And, and it's not because I don't know people. I have a, I have a really, really huge network in Denmark here. It's, uh, so it was actually really, really hard to just get five good examples. But it had been really, really, really easy to list 500 companies saying they were doing it. Yeah. So there was a big gap between how many companies claiming to do it and, uh, and how many actually doing it. I don't know, do you say that we have this kind of saying like uh, AI is a little bit like teenager sex? There's a lot of talk about it, but few doing it. <laughs> Suppose, you know, it, it makes sense because there is a very strong commercial interest, le- like you just described, in doing it. Um, if you are indeed a startup that is looking to grow itself through venture funding, sprinkling some AI-driven fairy dust on top just makes sense, right? But if we think about, for example, from a consultancy perspective, um, where implementations are being pushed into practice, it's it's an entirely different story because there isn't really a door you can hide behind. No. And and what, what we're seeing is like, of course, there's a lot of consulting companies saying doing it and want to do it and also doing it and helping some companies doing it. But there was a time slot at least here, and I think we still have it, where there was huge gap between how many who want to buy AI consulting and, and how many who was capable of delivering it. So, you know, for every time there was one guy being capable of doing something AI, there was maybe 10 people who want to buy it. And if you are a comp- consulting company and you're very greedy, <laughs> I mean, then you're selling the, the same guy 10 times and you cannot do it, right? So in, in reality, like uh, for every time you had someone buying an AI expert, there was maybe only once <laughs> some guy getting an AI expert. And that means that when I've been looking around in, in uh, companies, what have been done, then 90% of the cases have been disasters from the beginning because it's really not skilled people from the consulting company being sent to the company to be doing it here. And and I actually think that this is a big, big, big part of the explanation why we've been seeing so many proof of concept not being put into production. Because it's maybe it's possible, you know, if you're not skilled to, to make a proof of concept, but putting into production, this is like where, where I take the skills. But, but, but something I've seen repeatedly many times have been in a proof of concept, you've been taking uh, all the data and then you should make some prediction on, on something. And then when you put it into production, it is not working. And no one understands why, why it's working in proof of concept and not in production. And when you look into it, then what has happened is that, that the people making the proof of concept have been taking all the data to build up the model. So they had no data to test it, if it was working or not here. And then he's been sitting tuning on the model, almost like on the specific data level. If it is data A, then the prediction should be blah, blah. If it's data B, then it should be blah, blah. So there's, I mean, there's no deep learning or no nothing. It's more like, you know, a spreadsheet or something like a stupid thing going on. But they claim it to be AI, and then they sort of look at it, and then it look like, you know, it's, uh, it's fantastic. When, when you have a proof of concept, it's really, really easy to predict if you already know the answer and you can cheat when you're doing it. But when you put it in production, you should predict you cannot cheat. And then you kind of see the difference between skill and not skill. And I think this is the part, big part of why we have seen such a huge problem putting things into productions. True enough. And like, if I reflect back on perhaps like 2018, 19, 2020 in Finland, with the moving of AI practical case studies from POCs into practice. Like if you take a look at the FIRE reports and you benchmark 2019 and 2020, and look, you look at some of the case studies, there is a drastic difference in, you know, both the quantity, but also kind of the quality of the cherry picked cases as well. And, you know, I suppose one of the reasons why the quality of the cases has evolved is like exactly like you said, like we're moving away from the first cases that were on retroactive data. So data that has been gathered historically into these new pipeline cases where the pipelines and the data aggregation methods have been built for these new services and products with machine learning in mind. And I suppose the second explaining reason could be at least in Finland, which is its you know own very specific market, is the fact that by chance a quite a strong consultancy scene managed to emerge in Finland, which means that a lot of the industrial organizations that were starting to implement AI actually had some of the expert resources there to do the handholding at first, so that the successful adoption of those cases was 
maybe just a little bit faster than if you'd started off with a pure play academia collaboration. And using that as a segue, <laughs> um, I'd love to ask you about the academia side as well. So could you give us an overview as to what the status of research and kind of research financing of AI is today within Denmark? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, let me start with the good news. And that is that we, we're putting up a new AI center in Denmark. Uh, I think it's official opening in January the 1st. And we got an American AI rock star to the country. And it's uh, funded with uh, 60, 70 million euros. That's a nice thing. And then, but we recently, I made as a, as a so I'm a digital advisor in Denmark and as a part of that, and we made, made some research in Denmark and it's in, in technical IT, I'm not talking about AI, technical IT, we, we have uh, around 300 professors and associates and full professors at the universities in Denmark in total. We have, we have around uh, 300,000 companies in Denmark and we have around 6 million people. And, and if you just make the calculations here, it, it is like, as I told you here, we have a situation where we, that IT is almost only something going on at the universities. And that means that, that you have around 300 persons in all kinds of disciplines in technical IT which have to help uh, 300,000 companies. That's one person to 3,000 companies. And in addition, you have to do the normal stuff, you know, like teach and do research and so on. So we have very, very few people in Denmark doing uh, research in general in IT, but the, but the standard is very, 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 very high. So this, this is kind of the situation. So if you talk about what, what is the funding situation, and the, the, the very few people in Denmark have plenty of money. But there's very few people, so we, we need much more people, and we have not been investing in into getting more people. It's a more being, and this is because I think it's more easy, you know, to uh, say here's 100 million euro, one time. It, it is more hard to get the political decisions, like saying here's 200 more employees permanent, and this is the need. Yeah, because if you just take the same 300 people here and just give them more more money, then you will just stress them out. Yeah. So what you what you really need is like getting more people. And now with the new AI research center that you mentioned, um, is one of the primary targets of that to kind of increase not just the quality but also the quantity of the people that are actually contributing contributing into the field. Exactly. And um, piggybacking on the center, but also in general, um, I understand the problem with the ratio, but how is the collaboration between the research academia and the corporation sector in Denmark today? So I could be negative and I could be positive. So let me first give you the positive side here. And on the positive side is that if you go to uh, south of Europe, for example, then it's kind of, you don't do it. I mean... That's it's not happening. So it's kind of two separate worlds here. And this is this is absolutely not the situation in Denmark here. Yeah. People like to work together here. Yeah. People want to work together. And this is good. So we have a good start, like you know, the university wants to work together with industry and the industry wants to work together with the academia. But we have the government uh, and have been making tons of uh, complications in working together. Yeah, w- one thing is that you were putting up saying that that the universities should earn money for the corporations. And then you've been putting in some people in charge of the university should earn some money for these corporations. And it sounds like a good idea, maybe. Like, why not should the university earn some money by, from it, right? But if you look look into what is, what is happening is that, that the universities in Denmark it is like, you know, maybe they're getting 100 million in revenue for corporations, but they're actually spending a uh, half a billion in maintaining this, getting this revenue in. So it's, it's a non-profitable thing for the university. But this is not, you know, that we're using like, you know, maybe 400 million. I mean, that we're spending money on trying to get money. That's maybe not the worst thing. The worst thing is that the contracts to, when, when, you, when you want to work together with the university as an industry, you have to make a contract. And such contract could be 100 pages. And it, and it could cost, you know, like two, 300,000 in attorneys to make it. This, this is like, you know, uh, it's money, 
and it's time consuming to uh, go in and make this kind of uh, deal with the universities. And then this make, you know, especially small companies, if it's a one billion contract uh, cooperation between a big company and the universities, I said, who cares that we're spending, you know, one million at some time on making our contract. But if we're talking about working together with smaller companies, like, you know, with 100 person and 50 person, this, more, and this is what Denmark is built of. This is built of a lot of small companies. And the cooperation with them is like, you know, that is really, really tough for a small company saying, I spent 200,000 on a lawyer and I sit and read, you know, 100 pages with a contract and so on. That's, that's a nightmare. So I believe, you know, that maybe 90% of all cooperation is not happening because of this law in Denmark. But in the new digital strategy in Denmark here, we have uh, as one action point is to go in and, and look at this law here. And there's another, there's an, I don't know, do, do you have tech transfer office in, in, uh, in Finland? Or did, this, is, this is an office at university which have the op, uh, obligations uh, to kind of establish the connection between industry and academia. In this case, it would be not the innovation department, but the actual um, collaboration departments themselves. And the way that it's generally speaking managed in Finland is that a lot of, for example, the data science research establish these own units like a center of wireless communications or the Finnish center of artificial intelligence, which then have these own private units in that are specifically built for engaging with the private sector. But there is this kind of a curtain between the basic research and then the application research. Got it. We have something similar in Denmark, but what we have is that at all universities, then like no matter where you come from, department you come from, if you want to work together with the industry, you have to go to a specific uh, office. And that office is like, uh, have too few people and you have to make this 100 page contract. And this is kind of a blocker. In the system, and, and the unfortunately thing is that everybody, if you if you talk for someone from the government, they believe that these offices are helping making the cooperation with the industry, but in reality they don't have the energy to do it. The only thing you have the energy to do is to make this contract. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm sorry, I'm just so depressed about that because this is really like a blogger. And the reason why we got this uh, is actually something going on in the whole EU almost, except Sweden. Yeah. And the reason why, of course, there was uh, tons of uh, politicians going to the US, and then there was American University, which had been uh, making a patent and then sold it and got a lot of money for it. And then they came back to Europe saying, we want to have a law also saying that we should get money. And so far we haven't succeeded. And, in, and then we have the big problem in Denmark, that is that we are terrified that we are not ob- obeying the law 120%. If you're going somewhere else in Europe, I mean, people is like, ah, that is okay, right? That's working. But in Denmark, we, we have to be 200% sure that this is according to the law here. And that basically means it's, it's kind of uh, this law and this kind of attitude we have is blocking everything. We had the same thing with, the, with GDPR in Denmark where everybody else, I and mean, when I was talking with people around in Europe, I mean, after the implementation of GDPR, people was like, you know, what is GDPR? And in Denmark, we didn't do any IT in a whole year because everybody had to think for a whole year, like, <laughs> how do we apply this law here? Uh, 200%, right? Yeah, at best, a lot of the countries just used it as a sales tool, is that... Now we have GDPR compliant people who can buy them from uh, us. Exactly. And this, this, this is one of the main problems in Denmark actually is, so, so generally you have like that the administration part are getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the public administrations here. And people here have to explain what they're doing. This is, a li- I'm saying a little funny, right? So look at my smile, you cannot see it in an interview here. But, but, but it is a little like, you know, the most popular thing to do something about in the public administration is new regulation for AI. And if you've been working for a whole year in the public uh, administration and you haven't come up with a new rule for AI, I mean, then you, f- then you feel yourself as a failure, right? So you have to come up with all this regulation all the time, yeah? And then, then we have, you combine it with Denmark where we really, we really want to buy all the rules 200%. That's a major problem. Yeah, and I think it's a major problem that that you make specific rules about AI, 
and let me put it in the form. If you look into the GDPR, that is not mentioning technology at any point. It's technology agnostic, and that's fine. That's cool. You talk about the values you want to achieve. You want to be, you know, private data and so on, and ethical things and so on. That's good. But that's getting a lot of regulations out right now about AI. And that's very specific on AI. And then to be sure that it covering every every kind of AI, if you look at the EU regulation and many other regulations, then you're saying it's almost like if you put two numbers together, it is AI. And everything put two, two numbers together, that suddenly we, we're getting in a situation where everything is defined as AI, and then you get all these regulations getting out here. And I think this is really, really bad for Europe. Really bad. It, it could be if you go and look into the traffic light and so on, how you're allowed to drive, then we make up rules saying that you're not allowed to, uh, you have to stop when there's a red light, right? That's a good rule. Make such kind of rules here, yeah. but don't tell how to build <laughs> to build the car. I mean, that's a stupid thing, here, yeah. And that, that is what you're trying to do right now in the AI. This is just something which is uh, it's not good for Europe. I mean, this is bad for Europe. And, and, and they try to sell it like, you know, it's a business advantage. It's not a business advantage because it's killing business in, in Europe. I think it could be a business advantage if you're saying stop for the red light. And you talk about value here, yeah, but it need to be technology mm, yeah. agnostic behind it here. Yeah. I buy your argument 100%. And uh, a couple of episodes back on inference, we had uh, Mark Kane from World Economic Forum, and we were actually discussing the topic of you know, the problem of regulation and some of the theories toward approaching regulation. And, you know, two of, I suppose, of the core points that we raised up in the conversation is that regulatory instruments in terms of AI are exceptionally difficult to manage, right? Because first up, you're trying to manage a technology that is being developed at lightning speed. So there's no, even it's not even theoretically possible to have regulation that would be one step ahead of that development. And then another perspective that we've considered was that um, perhaps carpet bombing isn't necessarily the best way to approach regulation, but instead an education of pre-existing regulatory boards. So if you think about the regulation of medicine, if you think about the regulation of insurance or legal, those have pre-existing well-functioning regulatory bodies today, but what they are lacking is the fundamental understanding about AI. So instead of putting this kind of a holistic approach to everything that is considered data science and machine learning, perhaps try augmenting pre-existing regulations with the, some of the most up-to-date information and hand the keys to them. It's a good idea. And if, if, if you look in uh, in Denmark, we have something called, for, this, this is just an example, align what you're talking about here, I think. We have something called a data ethical council. You have a 60 person, I think 60 or 17 person in that council, uh, counseling the government. Yeah, there's no one of these six or seventeen person with a formal IT education. I mean, no one. We also have an an economy council, economy wise men, which are coming with good advice to the government. Here, everyone, everyone have an a, a master degree in economy, right? <laughs> and professors and so on. <laughs> and this is this is really funny. I mean, it's just like when it's, it's, if it is IT, oh, I don't need anyone with formal competences at all here. I, I have just been watching the latest Terminator movie, right? <laughs> this is kind of a Hollywood dictating how the world is. This, this is totally crazy. And and if you move to anything else, it is like, I mean, then, then you have the respect of her formal competences. And please understand me. I think it's good that you have that people with the... Uh, you know, decrease in philosophy and decrease in journalism and what so what not involved in this kind of council here. But having no one with IT, that is disrespect for, for IT. Yeah, yeah. And for this reason, I'm a big, big fan of what you call this kind of center of excellence models, um, which can be, you know, used in within large organizations to basically act as internal consultants. But if you think about the public sector, for example, if you think about cities or municipalities or just different organizations that have cross-cutting functions that need knowledge on AI. Um, implementing this kind of a central service unit that exists to first educate all of those operative units and then to assist them in kind of scoping out and uh, finding the optimal use cases for machine learning 
um, I'm a huge fan of this kind of thinking because then you're not stepping on the toes of the people who are experts within their fields, but you basically exist to offer them more tools and offer them more knowledge to be able to make these more informed decisions as a collaboration. And I suppose, you know, hearing about the Danish um, new research driven unit that is being opened in the beginning of 2022, it sounds like a big, big, big step toward that. Um, and I actually, on the, on the topic of public sector, I'd love to ask you about the kind of the financing of AI development. So is there financing support from the public sector toward um, the private sector or implementation side of that? No. It's the short answer. <laughs> we, have, we have, you know, uh, that that been, you know, maybe like, you know, 100 million Danish, uh, like, you know, 20 million euros to to do some uh, PUCs in the public sector, maybe 20 million euros to do something for private or something like that. But but this this is like, you know, ridiculous small money we're talking about here. We, we are looking into right now a situation I mean, for decades we have had that IT have been uh, representing 50% of the growth in Europe. I say 50% of the growth. And, and we have still a situation where IT are representing a huge amount of the growth. We have like, you know, we, we're talking about, generally speaking, that in the new, near future here, the 50% of all work will be, will, will be digitalized or, or there will be, be robots and so, taking over here. So what do you think about and that here we have AI is a big, big, big part of that. Yeah. So what do you think about is that you take all salaries, every every person that's getting in your country, you take all the salary money to the first in the month or whatever, when you get the paycheck, take all paychecks, then then cut off 50% of that. Take 50% of that off. Now you're looking at how much money you get in the in the in the future if you don't invest in, in AI and digitalization, right? This is ridiculous. If, if you were going to your pension advisor or something like that, and he, he was saying to you, hey, you know what? I will, in a few years, I will take, I will cut down, your salary will be cut down to the half, but just give me two years every year and you will be good. Would, would you believe him? I would not, but this is actually what the government is trying to tell us. 20 million years, who cares? And Stephen, with that, we're starting to reach the end part of the episode on the state of AI in Denmark. And with that, I would love to get your perspectives and your recommendations for the future. So in your opinion, what does Denmark need right now? When we talk about the advancement of machine learning in practice, when we talk about the advancement of IT into the practical implementation and the growth of that. Um, so what should Denmark be focusing on next? Uh, three, three things and, and uh, the first thing is that full stop for all uh, regulations which are targeting AI specifically yeah that should be banned I mean that should be illegal to do and and then it should be you should have some competent people making regulations uh, right now we're just making regulations to make regulations here this is like that have to stop yeah otherwise we will there was not nothing will go on you no matter what you do you can kill everything with the regulations and I, I, I normally I make a little joke saying that if I was Facebook or uh, you know one of the big American uh, companies everybody are talking about you know this is the mean ones this is the reason why we make regulations but I actually I will use all my lobby money to these people make, who want to make regulations because they are, I've never seen any regulation seriously hitting or doing any different with the big companies, but it's killing all the small startups. And all the small, if you kill all the small startups and the small companies, then you kind of, you know, that's a good thing for the big companies because then you don't have to buy them up when you're getting, grow, when you're getting bigger, right? So I mean, all these regulations is just made for making big companies bigger today and kill innovations. That's how I see it. It's, uh, so that's the first thing. You have to think about making regulation in a new way here. That's, not, that's number one. Number two, we, we, we have almost no technical people in the Denmark here. This kind of, so you, you, you need to scale up like that we get a lot of educated people. And here what I will do is that I will look to uh, Brazil and India 
because here we have some countries which kind of been in a situation with, uh, if you take Brazil, very few people being educated, but suddenly get some oil money and then try to find out how to educate the whole populations very, very, very fast. We need, to, we need to learn for them, how do you do this? Because we are in the same situation. That's number two for me here. And, and then number three is like, you know, uh, we, we need to invest heavily in, into uh, to this digitalization process. And we need to keep the companies in, in the country being successful. If you, just, if you just sell it, you know, if you sell a company for, let's say, $1 billion, I don't know, I mean, then, then you have a few people being happy on Hawaii or not, <laughs> and that's totally fine. It doesn't change for Denmark that we get a new Novo or we get a new, I mean, we have these big companies in Denmark, like you in Finland had uh, Nokia. You don't, get, you, you don't get a new Nokia by someone getting $1 billion. You need to invest to keep. And with that, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Um, for anyone interested in following up with um, the new AI strategy of Denmark, I recommend that you go to fm.dk, which is the Finance Ministeriet um, of Denmark, and look up the strategy. Now, the pages are available in English, it seems, so makes makes for a bit of an easier navigation. And also do not hesitate to look up subwiz.com for any of the needs that you may have for customer service improvement and optimization in Denmark. And once more, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. And for anyone listening, have a great day.